Hello again, everyone. I'm Dr. George Simon, and welcome to another edition of the new Character Matters program. This is the program where we talk about what I consider to be the defining issue of our time. Understanding the character crisis that we've been in for several decades now, and what we need to do to turn things around. Because, as always, character matters perhaps more today than ever before. So whether we realize it or not, whether we are prepared to accept the fact or not, it really does matter who we are and how we conduct ourselves, who we want ourselves to be in this world, how we want to walk this path. And toward that end, I've written all my books in Sheep's Clothing, Understanding and Dealing with Manipulative People, Character Disturbance, The Phenomenon of Our Age, The Judas Syndrome, How Did We End Up Here, and my latest offering, Essentials for the Journey, Embracing and Living the Ten Commandments of Character, Proven Principles for a Psychologically Healthy and Spiritually Rich Life. I've written all these books in the hopes that we will come to a new appreciation and reclaim the importance of character in our lives and understand just what we need to do to foster character growth in one another and in ourselves. Toward that end, I've been talking most recently in the podcasts about severe character disturbances, the most malignant forms of narcissism expressed as antisociality, sociopathy, and psychopathy. And today I'd like to continue that discussion. I'd like to continue the discussion because there is still, unfortunately, a lot of misinformation uh, about these various personality types, uh, how to spot the signs, how to deal with the issues that inevitably arise when you're uh, having to deal with such folks, and most especially, what kind of help to seek when you really need help, how to get the proper guidance and support, because there's just as much misunderstanding among the general public, as there is among helping professionals about just what makes certain folks tick. And along those lines, I'd like to uh, set a framework for you today, uh, especially with regard to how uh, certain characters develop. Now, in my books, I have discussed this framework at length. And I have divided the various personalities into two uh, basic groups. You know, we develop strategies about how to deal with the world and its many challenges. And we develop uh, a sense of personal identity, how we like to see ourselves and how we like to operate in the world. Over time, in our formative years, and for some folks, the way they put themselves together and the way they eventually come to view and prefer to deal with the world has a lot to do with the traumatic events that they have experienced, the fears and insecurities with which they have struggled, the qualms of conscience um, that they may uh, have had, and the defenses that they have unconsciously built around all of these things. And traditionally, we have called these individuals to one degree or another neurotic, which means that they largely barely understand why and how they do things. They're pretty much on automatic drive, 
letting their unconscious fears and insecurities and their inner conflicts dictate how they respond to the world. At the other end of a spectrum are the individuals that I refer to in my books as merely character disturbed. It's not so much their fears and insecurities and the unconscious defenses that they have built that guide their behavior. Rather, it's their preferences based on their own innate tendencies and their level of comfort with those tendencies and the amount of reinforcement that they've experienced over time dealing with things in a certain way. They develop a style of relating that appears to work for them, gets them what they want. And they're not so unconscious about it all. In fact, they're pretty conscious of it all and very comfortable with it all. And in our day and time, we have many more folks among us who are better described as merely impaired in character, disturbed in character, maybe even disordered in character, as opposed to neurotic. So once again, this is worth repeating. So once again, this is worth repeating. In our day and time, there are more and more folks among us who bring trouble into their relationships, not so much because of their fears and their insecurities and their unconscious hang-ups, but rather because of their inadequately formed consciences, their inadequate internalized moral compass, and their lack of of concern or care and their lack of apprehension about doing what it is that they feel like doing and their sense of entitlement to do as they please. This is a radically different age. It is the age of character disturbance. And the big variable the most important factor in that has to do with level of conscience development. Now, conscience is not identical to the uh, old Freudian concept of superego, but it's very similar. Most of us, to some degree or another, over time, internalize certain values and standards, expectations, norms that society teaches and reinforces in us. We make those things a part of ourselves, and that forms our conscience. Now, I said most of us, because there are some folks that not only don't seem to do this very well, but don't seem to form healthy consciences at all. And there are many reasons for this in our day and time. And the effects are profound. Now, the folks that we have traditionally called neurotic to one degree or another, those walking worried, those wounded souls, troubled inside, uh, form consciences relatively easily. They have the capacity to experience fear and discomfort uh, at life's trials and tribulations. And so, in their growth and development, as they're encountering the challenges of the world, and meeting with all kinds of trials and tribulations, in their fear and in their insecurity, they build defenses. They do this largely unconsciously. 
but they also internalize certain inhibitions. For example, they might on impulse follow the lead of a friend and engage in some daredevilish behavior and injure themselves, become traumatized by the event, and then internalize a certain degree of fear about doing such a thing again and become more cautious. The friend, however, may be predisposed entirely differently. They may lack the same level of apprehension. They might be relatively fearless in their constitutional makeup and despite injury, may very well engage in the same daredevilish behavior again. And when it does not cause their demise, it may reinforce in their mind that there is nothing to fear. They may even, after repetitive episodes like this, come to believe that they're invincible People shape up in personality and in character in very different ways. And for too long, for way too long, most psychological perspectives have assumed that most people emerge in adulthood as to one degree or another neurotic and harboring some degree of conscience. Conscience that sometimes causes some inner conflict between our baser impulses and instincts and the demands of a civilized world. This is an extraordinarily unsafe assumption to make, and for folks seeking help, Professionals who are overly married to this paradigm can do a lot of damage. We live in times where an absence of apprehension, when a lack of what some researchers call adaptive fearfulness, and a lack of what we have traditionally called conscience, is the greater shaper of the person's character. And then the issues that come from relating to such a person take on a whole new dimension, a whole different perspective. So I'd like to elaborate a little bit today about those folks who are significantly impaired in conscience who lack adaptive fearfulness, who don't hesitate at all to go and to do what others would have a problem allowing themselves to do, that others would have some anxiety about doing. These are the heartless, fearless, warriors among us that fit within a category that I call the aggressive personalities. And one of the reasons these folks have had such trouble forming any kind of a decent conscience is because of their innate abhorrence. And notice I didn't say fear their innate abhorrence of subordination, of submission. They don't just fear it. In fact, they may not fear it at all. They may be very well acquainted with what it's like to be subordinate or to be submissive to a person, place, or thing. They simply detest it. It's not in their nature. 
they have a built-in revulsion to this kind of thing. And therefore, they resist the process of what we call socialization at almost every step of their development. I say in workshops all the time, some rhyming little phrases to bring home the point. You see, when we internalize, when we take to heart one of society's prohibitions, one of those, no, you can't do that messages from society, when society basically wants to sanction us or chastise us for thinking about, let alone acting upon, one of our baser instincts or primal urges, when we take those prohibitions to heart and we internalize them, and we say to ourselves, basically, yeah, you know what? I'd kind of like to lash out in this way, but I've been taught that it's wrong, that there'll be negative consequence, that there are other ways. And when we make it a part of our operational schema, and we make it a part of our emerging conscience that we will not allow ourselves to do such things, that internalization of those societal prohibitions are ultimately an act of submission. So the rhyming phrase I use is internalization of a prohibition is in essence an act of submission. The very thing that some personalities are naturally wired to detest. Notice again, I did not say necessarily fear. Some folks simply abhor the notion of caving in, backing down, putting a lid on things, subordinating their will to a higher will, society's will, if you will. And so they fight the socialization process every step of the way. And when they emerge in adulthood, they have poorly developed consciences, if any conscience at all. And if on top of that, they have a deficient capacity for empathy or an absent capacity for empathy. They have difficulty caring or they can't care. Then you have the makings of a severe character disturbance or disorder. And in our day and time, these disturbances are becoming more common. There are too many individuals among us who are not apprehensive enough about what they let themselves do, who not only have resisted society's civilizing influences, but who have set themselves above even the need to subordinate themselves in any way. Worse, perhaps the strategy of dealing with the world on their own terms, setting their own rules, and resisting any self-constraint has worked for them, has gotten them things that they want. And that only reinforces their strategy for dealing with life. Now, one would have to wonder why in the face of certain negative consequences, as inevitably happen with these folks, they don't seem to modify their stance or learn from their experience. And traditionally we have thought 
that this is because that they unconsciously employ certain defenses such as denial, projection, and a few other things. But the much larger reason that these folks persist in their heartless, cruel, abusive, exploitative behavior, despite the occasional negative consequence, is that to evaluate the negative consequence, to ascribe it to one's inadequate or flawed strategy, and then to modify one's behavior requires two things that some folks are simply not naturally inclined to do. The one I've mentioned before, which is subordination, kind of caving in, seeing what society has been trying to tell you and then saying to yourself, okay, yeah, I get it. I really need to refrain or modify my stance, my approach to life. But the other variable has to do with what it takes to change. And what it takes is the dirtiest four-letter word in the Disturbed Characters Dictionary. W-O-R-K. Work being the ultimate subordination or submission paradigm. If I'm going to conform, if I'm going to be the kind of person the society seems to want me to be, but I am predisposed otherwise, that I'm going to really have to work at modifying my style because it doesn't come naturally to me. And why, by the way, should I do it? If I've been largely successful, at least in my opinion, doing things my way. Why should I turn myself over to something bigger, especially knowing how much work it will entail? If I don't have the heart for that, and unfortunately, in our day and time, there are too many folks among us who do not have the kind of heart for that kind of work. Now, why is understanding this framework so important? Two reasons primarily. Most of us know enough of the psychology we've been taught to be dangerous to ourselves and to others. And by that I mean, most of us really don't get it when it comes to severe character dysfunction, despite the fact that our gut probably is a good barometer. We can intuitively sense many times when someone's conscience is really lagging when they don't seem to be concerned about what they let themselves do, when they can behave in the most abusive and exploitative man manner without qualms and without apparent care or empathy, most of the time our gut reacts and says, we're in the presence of someone who isn't very much like us. But nonetheless, the things that we've been taught about human beings and the reasons that they do things affect us and affect our perceptions. And if we, despite our gut hunches, assume that somebody must be dealing with fears and insecurities, maybe they're compensating for low feelings of self-esteem. If we adopt that framework, and even worse, if we seek professional help, and that's the kind of feedback we get, then we don't really learn how to protect ourselves 
in this increasingly character-disturbed world of ours. There are too many entitled folks among us who may profess that they care, but simply don't care enough. Who are dishonest to the point that they can't honestly reckon with themselves and with their own issues. And who lack restraint, who lack apprehensiveness, who lack adaptive fearfulness and will do on impulse what most of us would hesitate to do. And on top of being uninhibited, feel entitled to do what they have the impulse to do. We live in very different times. And there are those among us on a spectrum of character disturbance whose very way of being and operating in the world reflects their lack of conscience, their lack of caring, and their feelings of entitlement to do whatever it is they think they need to do to get whatever it is they think they want and without regard for the consequences because they're not going to let that stop them even if they experience a negative consequence. They don't see any reason to subordinate themselves even in the face of disappointment or failure. And they certainly don't have the heart for the work that it would take to self-correct. And I'll have more to say about these most seriously disturbed characters among us and what you need to do to protect yourself, how to properly vet a potential relationship partner and spot the red flags for a serious level of character disturbance, and what we have to do as a society and among helping professionals to help turn things around, to reduce the growing numbers of folks among us who are so under-inhibited and overly entitled that they do as they please to the detriment of all. I'm Dr. George Simon. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you'll avail yourself of the many resources on my blog at drgeorgesimon.com. You see the URL above me here. And avail yourself of my books, all of it readily available on Amazon and other resellers. And so until the next time, take care.